away from the word, we won't have anything to share to the next generation. It won't be what God intended it to be. So this standing firm, this, this truth, and allowing this truth to be what it is that we stand in. You see what I'm saying? The, he encourages Timothy to stand strong in his faith with reliance on the written word of God. This letter echoes many of the themes Paul uses in his letters. It must be preserved and proclaimed. One of the primary reasons Paul wrote to Timothy is because the gospel at that time, which I shared before, was under attack. False teachers had infiltrated the church and were adding to the gospel, saying more than repentance and faith in Christ were necessary for salvation. Or there was even some situations where they were subtracting from the gospel, saying less than just repentance and faith in Christ were necessary for salvation. Um, so it wasn't a true faith at all. And Paul knew that if the pure gospel was not preserved, there would be no good news left to proclaim. Of course, the gospel is still under attack today. Okay? Both outside and inside the church. I wrote, most Christians expect the inevitable attacks from the world, but fewer, this is for us, listen to this, but fewer of us are prepared for the attacks that come from within the church. What happens when we're expecting the world and the enemy out there, but when it's inside the church or it's inside because there's an immaturity or a lack of understanding or a lack of wisdom from God's word being grown in the church, it can, those false things, we can get caught up in that stuff. And what happens when it becomes our foundation in the false things? We have to learn to stand in the truth. Over time, some churches added to the gospel and end up preaching a message of salvation by faith in Christ plus works. These are the things that we see even today. It's, it's shared all the way out. There is not one good thing in you that you can add and let God have that is yours, that adds anything to your ability to make yourself right with God. But you can choose freely, out of your free will, to love Him back. You can choose freely to give Him your life and your, and your time and all the things that God has blessed you with so that you are effective as a, as a light or a minister of the gospel back to the world that God has redeemed you from. That's the thing in this that is so important. And we need to learn that our identity in Christ means that he's calling us with a purpose and a call. Yes. It's no longer good enough to just be known as Christian and sit on the sidelines and be good, be a good Christian in the worldly sense. It's, it's never good enough anymore. I think you'll find that your joy will disappear. Your, your effectiveness in relationship will dissipate. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. If we, if we sit on the sidelines in certain relationships instead of encouraging in the truth, pretty soon, have we lost the opportunity to speak truth into that? Yes. When we are, when we are presented with false things, it's our job to be the light. Cast the darkness out. There is no, you know, darkness in the absence of light. And if Christ's light is in us, the darkness cannot reside in us. So if we allow darkness around us, we are choosing to not shine Christ's light into situations. So it's literally rejecting the righteousness of Christ and turning away from it. Paul really is trying to encourage this young pastor, Timothy, to literally stand in the truth. But this isn't just for pastors. I want to say this. This is for leaders of families. This is for mothers that are raising children. This is for grandparents that are speaking into their families' lives. It is so important that we see the truth of the gospel and how important it is that that alone, the good news of what Jesus did is enough in relationship. There is nothing that we add to it. I love understanding these things, but it's, it's still heavy. As we, as we see in our culture that certain churches have added things to the, the workspace side. As long as you, you know, at this time, do these things, then everything's going to be good for you. I'm not going to get into it. There's so many things. I, can, I don't want to point out one or another. It's, not, it's really not about that. The heart, the heart of God is that we would come together. Last night was an amazing opportunity for, for that. When, we, when we're coming and sharing together in the big C church, loving the community, God's glorified. If we put down our, 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 you know, our issues and our other stuff, and then we start coming together for what God's doing, he will, he will stand in us. He will give us what we need to be strong. But the enemy is also going to come to attack us. That's the, that's the part of it. The second part of what Paul really shared in this section of 2 Timothy was that many Christians are not prepared to suffer. 
um, a major theme in this book. Clearly, suffering is a major theme of 2 Timothy, just as it was throughout the rest of the New Testament. Jesus, the apostles, and many other first century church suffered greatly from preaching the good news. And yet, many Christians today seem unprepared to suffer for Christ. I've encountered many people in my path, many people that, um, I'll be honest, a lot of us are pretty immature in our understanding starting out, right? That's natural. You can't have a deep understanding unless you've been raised in it, right? As I encounter a relationship with um, starting youth or young parents or different things, um, our, our hopes, our perspective is on things that we put out there. We have an expectation for God or, or, or what we think it's supposed to be. Instead of as a maturing Christian, we, we let down our expectation and ask God, what do you want? And what I'm seeing is a shift in some of us here. I mean, it's so exciting to me as your pastor to, to see hearts open to God asking God, what does he want? Not being quick to join back into the old path, the old life, um, and, and get back into things the, the way that, short, taking shortcuts really is what it comes down to. The enemy loves it when we take shortcuts. Because he'll, he'll, 99% or 90% of what he's trying to do is adding good things into your life, but with a twist. Just a little twist to get you just a little bit off course. And what happens when we're a little bit distracted, a little bit off course? We become, we become ineffective. <clears throat> and I think, you know, we are going to suffer. There's going to be things, as we learn to stand more strong in strength and stand more boldly, we will suffer. And it might be in reputation and worldly things. It might be we have friends that are going to choose to, you know, walk away from us. Uh, people that don't really want to follow God with their whole heart and are uh, disturbed by the fact that you're willing to ask God for those things versus just do what you've always done. And it's okay. You're not alone. I have, I have some friends that uh, I meet with pretty regularly, and I have some discipling pastors that I connect with, and I hear it constantly that it's, it is a lonely road. The enemy likes to make you think you're alone. But when we remember what Christ says, and we surround ourselves with people that love Jesus in the same way, and our family of God that are doing the will of the Father, it changes everything because you're really not alone. Hard times come. Certain situations are out of our control. How many of us in this time right now have situations that are out of your control in your life? Lots of hands up, right? So there's no Jesus in this room handling that. No. So he, he's still working through us, but there's things that he has to do, right? That's amazing that we still realize that, but it's, it's important that we actually let him do it. I had a situation this week where I had picked something back up in the middle of the night, didn't even realize it. I woke up, I just had this huge burden on me, and it was just from an immature place, a lack of faith. And it was really interesting because I talked to my wife about first thing in the morning, and we just prayed together and said just a simple prayer. Lord, I give this over to you. You know, last night I gave it to you. I don't know why I'm picking it up again this morning in the middle of the night. Almost. I, I feel like it's kind of a demonic attack in the middle of the night with just a perception of a feeling, you know what I mean? Things that are, as a head of your house, you're going to have a lot of concerns. You're going to have to cover things. Well, I'm, I'm going to be straight up honest with you. Fifteen minutes later, the Lord just totally changed the whole situation. Open, I mean, as soon as I gave it to him, he's like, okay, now I can handle things for you. It's just, I, I, I would share that story one-on-one -on -one with you guys, but there's so many things that God wants to do in us. He wants to work a new thing in us. But are we pre prepared to suffer? I have encountered many believers uh, who are open, openly denying the prosperity gospel yet still seem to believe that as long as they have regular devotional life, avoid really bad sin, and participate at a church level, say it like that, then they will avoid suffering. That's a lie. I'm going to be honest. When we are trying to control things like that, we're really walking a fine line of telling God what it is we're expecting in our relationship with Him and what we're willing to say yes to from God. Um, many of us in this room have a lot of decisions in this next season, in the next probably several months that are going to change courses for you or your family. It could be jobs. It could be just where you move your house. It could be who knows what God's going to give you opportunity to do, but you need to hear from God in the big and the small. And I know, I know the enemy, Satan, he's, he's, he doesn't play uh, uh, fair. He uses the best plays every time. So in our men's group, we've been talking about this and in this context. Uh, if, he's, if he's got a play that works against you, he's going to just keep running until you learn to defend it. So you put that shield of faith up and don't let that happen anymore. And I think that's something that we need to be aware of. So the persecution that comes sometimes as we try to repent of the things that we have allowed the enemy to keep working on us coming back in, it's going to cost us some things. Sometimes we suffer from our own behavior and actions, don't we? 
Are, um, is there consequences for living outside of God's will? Absolutely. Yes. There's blessings in, the, in turning back to Him. The joy of the Lord, the peace of God, the purpose, the life that is full of the, the re real relationship with Christ. But sometimes it's not easy because I hate to say it, the enemy wants you to think that you're alone and there's no one else going through what you're going through. You guys know what I'm talking about. How many people in your life, friends, family, children around, just people in your life that feel that same way, that you might have that answer and you kind of sit back on the sidelines and just hope they are good enough to figure it out or open their Bible on their own. The, the truth is, the gospel is the good news, but the, the rest of the thing is the word of God that we have to obey. Matthew 28, go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all my commands. And Jesus then says, and don't forget, I will leave with you until the very end of the age. So you're not alone. He's with us. His Spirit is in us when we are submitted and repented before Him. But it's, there's, something, there's something in our natural tendency that it literally wars against this fundamental truth of God's Word, doesn't it? We want this to be like every other book out there where it's just like a, an awesome self-help book. I'm going to run my life as soon as I've messed up a little bit. I've dug a big pothole over here. I'm going to go to the Word, fix that pothole, and then I'm going to get back on my road. This book is the life. This is the truth. And if we, if we deviate from it at all, there is consequences in us, in our children, in our grandchildren. When we understand that the demonic influences of Satan is literally trying to almost give you the truth with just enough of a lie to twist you. And if, and if we're just hoping that the good things around us are always the true good things, we better have discernment. We better ask the Lord for those things. Are we praying to be wise in the kingdom? Are we praying for heavenly discernment that God would teach us things, right? It's, a, it's an interesting thing to have um, a desire to not be persecuted for faith when God says, Blessed are those who are persecuted. You guys understand what that means? Who, who's given the blessing? Then? God is. All right, let's read 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Is it up there? Perfect. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. He starts that first part. He's accountable in the presence. He, he knows what he's saying. He's going to go to the Father in accountability. He's sharing that with us, saying, I own this before God. How many times in your life have you heard from God for somebody and say, I own this with God before I share it with you? That's a pretty high call, right? I fear God too much, and I better hear from God before I say that to somebody. Right? This is huge. He says, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. As a parent, you have young ones that you need to teach. And the best way of teaching is what? By example. Are you living your life in the way that you want your kids and children to be raised and live in that life themselves? Do they see you making much of Christ, much of God, much of God's word in every aspect of your life, or do they only see you do it when you're trying to gather with certain people? What's your life really about? Are you reflecting Jesus in your personal and in the public? What is your heart? And that's what God is doing in us. He's, he's asking us. Paul is challenging Timothy in this. What's that mean to patiently correct? means over the top when they do one thing wrong to smack upside the head. Everything. No. Hey, maybe that's probably not the right way we could have said that. I had a friend share something uh, this morning on Facebook that was really cool because I felt the exact same way about some way someone's interpreted it. It's just kind of interesting. Sometimes to speak out on something, there's a fear that comes in us. They're like, hey, what? How's this going to be interpreted? How's this? But when, we're, when we put that truth out there and kind of break context of things, People can grow, people can learn, people can hear things, right? I don't know what God's going to give you this week to patiently correct. Maybe it's going to be yourself. Maybe it's going to be an area of your heart and life that you have to be patient with yourself because how many of us beat ourselves up really bad when we realize, man, I was way off course. And the enemy loves that, doesn't he? Why, why does he love that? When, you, when he has an end to help you beat yourself up, you don't think you have value because you quit believing the gospel, which is you don't have value anyway. Christ is the answer. He has enough value for all of this, right? He's going to do this good work in you. It's not about 
you know, I got to be in Christ and I got to be obedient and faithful and not, you know, sin for 10 days and then I'll be finally be on a path where I can trust that I have something to share. Is Jesus enough in every circumstance? Yes. He loved you right in the middle of your sin. He died for you yet while you were still sinning. That is such important. That's what people need to hear. You don't have to get fixed up. You just trust in Jesus. But once we believe that and that faith comes in, now we've got to patiently correct and encourage people. Sometimes rebuke when it's willfully disobedience in our life, in our families. There's a way to love people in truth, and sometimes discipline is hard. How many of you guys raised raise kids already? Can I talk to you afterwards? I don't even know how to do this. I'm working through it, but I'm telling you, it is not easy, is it? How many of us are in the, in the middle of the trial of it right now? Yeah. It is okay to not have every answer. But the Word of God does give us the right way. And when we reject it and follow worldly teachings or other things, are we going to produce in our children the fruit righteousness that God wants for us to produce? If we have to believe this, we won't at all. The world will tell you there's a thousand other ways than being honest and disciplining our children and taking care of things the right ways. Rebuking, encouraging your people. Who's your people in this parable? Timothy's got his church, the, the people he's leading, his leaders, and those that are doing things. But for us in this, it's for us too. Your people are those that follow you, that want to listen to you, that want to do life with you. Can you encourage your people? Can you bring that faith in your heart every time you're around them and you put that in them because Christ has put it in you? The daily thing. And encourage people with good teaching. Verse 3, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth, reject the truth, and chase after myths. Okay, let's, let's get a little context about that. What is actually going on here? Behind the scenes, there's a heart that says, I want to have an appearance of righteousness. I want to have the, the I want to have the peace of God, but I don't want to obey Him. I want to find people that uh, will encourage me instead of God's truth for me. I want to find people that will let me stay right in my kind of sin or wickedness or just this appearance of certain things, but still have the righteousness label. And is any of us righteous? <laughs> Christ alone is righteous. So this is the the times we're in, guys. I'm, I, I hate to tell you, right now is the times where many people are going around looking for people to affirm what they already want to be living in, and it's sin, and justify their sin as okay because I'm going to misuse or misinterpret one part of God's scripture and twist it so that you can stand firm in your sin and never have to reflect on the whole word of God that literally doesn't ever deny itself. God does not talk out of both sides of his mouth. He is the truth teller, and his word is for our good. But the world is going to fill people with this idea that, you know, I can love Jesus, I can love the idea of having a father in heaven, and I want to be in heaven. How many, how many of our friends that aren't believers like the idea of going to heaven? Right? You know what I mean? you, you got people in your life. Right? That context, I'm a good and moral per person, right? But what is good? How, is, how good is good? Several weeks ago, uh, Pastor Ken showed, I mean, what, what is the measure of good, right? <coughs> Think about that. But I want us to trust in God. And I want to stand in the truth. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. So there's a context here that is an intentional choice. Okay, At a certain point, there's probably a season where you can go trying to find answers out there. And at a certain point, you're going to have to weigh those answers against what you your conscience knows to be the truth, right? There's going to be this thing. And at a certain point, people, including us in this room, at certain times in our lives, have rejected the truth and turned towards a lie, a myth, a false thing, to, to find our foundation, right? What happened on that foundation that was crumbling? It just started shaking, and over time, it cost us a lot, right? Well, your, your friends and family, some of you, and, and a co you know, co-workers or whatever, are on that shaky foundation. The cornerstone, Jesus, is the one that they need to know and what he did for them, not what they can do to earn favor. It's that answer that will change them. But you're going to have to help them see the truth, and it's going to take a choice of rejecting the myth now to come back to the truth. There's this context of a lot of, a lot of um, 
unbelievers that have never heard of Jesus kind of walk around in neutral. I don't think that's the case. They have grabbed onto something that at a certain point to find Jesus, to choose Jesus, they're going to have to let go of that and grab something else, the truth of God, right? That's what happened in your heart. I, I promise you, every one of you in this room that loves Jesus and is obeying him and trying to live a life that's obedient, you had to let go of things in your life and choose Christ. You couldn't, you can't serve two masters. We talk about that all the time. I want to read John 16. You got that one. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Who is talking about that? Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. He has overcome the world. He's overcome every trial, every temptation. He has done this. So our hope, that's such a huge thing. We can take heart knowing that no matter what, that is going to be enough. That answer is going to be good. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put to shame, put us to shame, because God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Let's read Romans 5, 3 through 5. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Okay, I, I'm going to tell you guys right now, when I was younger, I don't know what it was, it was a lot easier to, to develop endurance. I'm, I'm pretty tired just from last night, and all I did was say hi and love on people, walk back and forth across the concrete all day, and I'm tired this morning and sore, so I, I think it's going to take me a little more work to persevere and have that endurance, you know, to like go hard. But I think it's important that we understand that the trials, the things that we overcome, give us the strength to know how to do that. Verse 4, and endurance develops strength of character. How important is our character before God? It's everything. Because if you are shaking in your character, you, you claim Christ, but your character can't walk in your call. If you're called by Jesus, okay, I'm going to draw a triangle right here like this. God's call and our character have to be able to hold up that call. If your character is weak, that, your call falls. And the enemy that loves that because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. If he can't take your salvation, what's he going to do? He wants to steal and kill your testimony and stop you from being effective in those lives around you. There's a lot of people that, go, after they go through really, really hard things, um, are going to turn back to God. Because that's what the Word of God says. Raise them up in the ways of the Lord, and they won't depart from it when they're old, right? But what does it mean in that in-between time? It means they're going to have all kinds of opportunity for the enemy to have all kinds of room and ground in their life. But what does that mean for us, knowing that we have to... Stand and yet keep standing. We gotta, we gotta allow these things to, to be who, we're, who we are. And the endurance develops strength of character. Character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead us to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. Did you guys catch something right there in that very last line? Can you? experience God's love without the Holy Spirit? I don't think we can without the Holy Spirit. We, he, he's the one. that It's His Spirit. It's God Himself. But it's, that's the way we feel it. That's the way we understand this relationship. Otherwise, it's like the Israelites, this cold, scary God on the mountain burning the rock and Moses, ah, that's too scary. I'm going to hide over here. No, it's the love of God, the drawing of hey, my nature isn't like God's, and, I, and I'm being drawn to trust the Word. I'm, I'm changing because God is changing me. He's changing my mind. He's, he's giving me new desires. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? How many of you guys have, your, have the good Lord change your desires? Raise your hand. Isn't that amazing? Can you share that confident news with other people because it's your testimony? That's what we're talking about when we, when we are who God's called us to be. I think that's so important. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. You know, the creator God, the word Jesus, who spoke everything into existence, could have spoke commanding authority of obedience into us that we had to obey, like slaves. But I want to be a chosen slave, meaning I choose 
to be slave to Christ and obey him, not have been forced to. That's the, that's the biggest lie, or one of the biggest lies, that the, all the other religions and all the other things that hate Christianity, specifically that, they say that you, you're, you're forced to do this, and that's not the case. We get to choose to love God and obey him and, and be his people. And it looks so different than control. You guys, you guys know what's happening in Iran and, and some of these other um, countries right now. The, the Islamic um, press has been so hard and so radical that there's the normal kind of middle of the road, kind of, I, I use the term nominal Christian, the nominal Muslim has, re, has been rejecting that and in their dreams are meeting Jesus and they're having to shut mosques down all over the place. And guess what that means? Churches are starting. Yes. But they're not big out in the public churches. You know what they are? Home churches, families, do a life with other families that are turning to this new truth that isn't control. But it's, it's, a, it's a release of what our nature is supposed to be in relationship with the Father. Do you guys know what heaven is? It's in the presence of God Almighty. That's what we we're created to be in his presence. How many of you guys want to know what that's like? I, I can't even fathom it, but I'm excited because I know that there's just something in me that knows that this just isn't all of it, right? That's exciting to know that there's something that we, in our human understanding, in this condition, in this broken body, aren't ready. I'm not ready to experience that, but God will make me ready, and the twinkling of eye will make you ready, and then we will be in the Father in that relationship. But to reject him means we choose presence away from God, which is where hell is. And it has lots of other characteristics too. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's not, you know, the hardships in hell, the fire or the, or the darkness or the, the, that as much as it will be the separation from the presence of the Father, which we were created to be. I was thinking about this um, when I was a little kid. I loved the wintertime because... We used to get just enough snow. I'd go out and I'd make snowmen or I'd make piles. And I loved having, I used to have G.I. Joe. The I was a doll player, but I loved that there were action figures, so let's be real. They used to have cool ones back in the day. I don't even know if these kids know what cool action figures are. Whatever. <laughs> but I used to play out in the snow, and we were, I'm talking battles, and boy, I can remember all this stuff. And there was one winter, we had, it must have been a long snow, and I'd been playing out there, and I lost a lot of them in the snow. Like, and I, I didn't realize at the time, and I was in the house, and I was looking back, I couldn't find it. And I was like, what in the heck? And, I, and, I, and then it was like a week later, I realized, oh, I know where I'm living. You know what I mean? It was like that realization hit. It was like one of those first times I was like, had to. But I got to thinking, because I cared about those little action figures like they were real people. I thought, I mean, they had character, you know, qualities. They were tight. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not a weirdo. <laughs> no, but the reality was that. That, that character was lost out there in that snow pile, and he had no relationship. And I was thinking about that the other day, which is kind of funny how the Lord just kind of gives you a thought again. I think that's literally what we are like, and God, God's heart for us, not that we're little action figures. He breathed life into us. We are created in his image, but as a child, you can kind of understand that, that desire to have everything whole and complete. And God isn't God of chaos, right? He created you with a purpose and these innate things in you. And he wants to use them to what? Bring him glory. And in that process, people are going to notice you. The more they notice you, the more that you look at he, people come to you, you're going to go, follow me as I follow Jesus. Follow me as I follow Christ. If they're not willing to follow Christ on their own, bring them in that way. That's what discipleship is. It's important. Verse 5, 2 Timothy. Where was I at? Five. I'll just start there. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Is there a ministry that you have been clued into in your own understanding that God has shared with you in opportunities to serve others? Finish and carry those things out. Do those things well. Remember, in this situation, Paul is telling Timothy, a pastor, overseer, that's he got leaders in the church, and he's like, hey, I'm encouraging you to tell those leaders to do these things well, lead well, right? But I want us to understand that this building and us being in this building isn't because we're together. Now we're a church. You are the church. I am the church. Wherever I go, the church is with us because Christ is with us. He is the church. He's building his church, and we are to not forsake the gathering 
of the brothers and sisters. That's what it says. Because we need encourage, we need to be reminded about these things. Because sometimes on our own, we get out there and kind of lost, right? But that is the church. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. Remember, this is Paul. Remember what's going on with Paul right here? He is suffering in prison, knows he's about to die at the hands of Nero. He's, this, is, this is happening. And he knows it. there's no getting out of this. But he's still faithful. He's still sharing these things. The time of my death is near. Verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. Who in this room wants that crown of righteousness? <coughs> Who wants to be part of the crown as our legacy? That is what we all want. That's the prize. And the prize is not just for me, he says. This is for us to listen. But for me, not just for me, but for all who eagerly, eagerly look forward to his appearing. Sorry about my laziness and rushing through words. I'm already reading them too far ahead. <laughs> who are eagerly looking forward to his appearing. How many of you guys in this room are looking forward to Jesus' return? Man, not, it's everything. You guys get more and more disappointed the darker this world gets? The less and less attached to it we become in some ways. It's kind of a good thing to have things a lot of chaos. If things were just rosy and beautiful and everything that you saw justice and there was this a lot of stuff felt a little bit, it might be a little harder to let go of this. But I'm telling you right now, it's getting easier and easier for me to start thinking about that and getting excited about that. The hard part is those around us that aren't in and don't believe and haven't trusted Jesus, that haven't learned to put their trust in him and choose God because that we know what the word says. They will be cast out. So that's the part of us, that's the duality of our understanding, right? Because we know we were there, and they might be there right now, God. But who's doing the work in them? God is. The Holy Spirit is already at work. I, I promise you this. I've shared this before, but I want you to hear it again. This is for somebody in the room. Your perfect word or perfect understanding or eloquent speech or, or like, grammatically correct laying out these things isn't what's going to make someone understand who Jesus is. God is doing that work. You know what they want to see is a reflection of Jesus in you. Yes. Is your love pure? Yes. Is it right? Is it the way that God wants it to be? Or is it self-motivated? Is it in these other things? It's a big deal. I think it's a really big deal. I want to read um, Romans 1 through 6. I have it up there. Romans chapter 1, one. Oh, I got 5 and 6, but let's, let's read this real quick. Um, this letter from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach the good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son in his earthly life, and he was born into King David's family line. And he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God, did, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey Him, bringing glory to His name. And you are, are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. That is what the good news is. We can all belong. It's not about some holy huddle and only the elite. I'm telling you, every religion out there that isn't Jesus-based, that Jesus is the way, every other thing, I'll say this from the pulpit, I'll probably get in trouble for it, but religion is demonic, you hate to say it, but every other false religion, false things out there specifically is in such a way to make all these other things more important. And they're all a twist of that. That's, what, that's really what it comes down to. But Jesus laid the way, and all who come to him. How many of us have heavy burdens at times, right? But what does he say about his burden? It's light. His yoke is light. When you wake up in the morning, you're carrying something for somebody. Give it over to God and let him carry it and trust God. And then obey. Obey his word. It's so important. I want to share this with you guys. This was something that the Lord laid on my heart. Um, I heard this about news in general. You guys know we're in a world full of 
information, right? Where it's the information overload, you get anywhere. I heard this about news, though. If you read the news, sorry, if you don't read the news, you're uninformed. If you do read the news, you're misinformed. So let me say this. So as God's children, let's share the good news and be transformed with true wisdom. If we choose to look at worldly news or worldly influence on all these other things and try to, you know, try to manipulate it and try to be like about that stuff, we're literally just focused on the wrong things. We need to be about the good news and let that transform us so that people see that transformation and walk into the new knowledge of this good news that we have. That's the only thing that works. True wisdom comes from God. I want to read this to you. Um, I'm going to start at verse 17. This is going to be James 3, starting at 17. James chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure, is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. This wisdom from God that he's calling us to understand in him is going to help us do these things. But kind of like Paul Harvey, you guys want to know the rest of the story? <laughs> you guys, some of you in the room know what I'm talking about. Okay, let's go. Let's read the beginning of that chapter, verse 13. I'm going to start there. Uh, my Bible has a heading in here that says, True wisdom comes from God. We're going to start at verse 13 and read through that whole section again. James chapter 3, starting verse 13. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that come from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? There's a lot of people out there got stuff going on. They're always trying to say, look at what I did, look what I did. And you know what I'm talking about. It happens around us all the time. Pay attention. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For whoever there is a so we're, sorry, for wherever there is a jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Verse 17 again. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, it is also peace loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism. And is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. So, when we're looking as a peacemaker in, in our relationships in our lives, how do we become peacemakers? We use the, the truth of God's word. We don't have to argue false things. We're not trying to convince on spiritual things that are not things we should be arguing about. As we've learned through this book of Timothy. There's things that we just don't need to argue about. We need to focus on what's important, right? Amen. But peacemakers are, how many of you guys have people in your life right now that you've heard one thing or another? Maybe maybe some, maybe some, the church, I'll, I'll use that term with the quotes, the church has heard them and they're, and they're you know, hurt by the church and they don't want to have a relationship with God's people in that way or they're using that as a reason to not be in church, right? You see what I'm saying? A peacemaker is someone that is, can come in and, and be in the church and love them right where they're at and bring them back into the fold of truth. Remember what's the truth? The gospel truth, what Jesus did. Not about, hey, that pastor up there shares the perfect message. It's about what God has done and what he's continuing to do in us, right? Do we love people enough to be the peacemakers? Bring them out of the lie, out of the chaos, out of the argument, into the peace. And I'm going to tell you right, right now, it's, it's going to be a challenge, but it's okay. Jesus can do this work in us. That's the exciting thing. He can do and will. He wants to. He wants to in his spirit. And, and in this holiday season, there's so many opportunities to connect. Use these times. Use these opportunities. You guys know people are more open this time of year. Yeah. You know how many tracks I handed out last night? Go God. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, you guys got an opportunity to, to, to be the family that you're supposed to be. Let Christ, the love of God in you, that, that desire to build relationships with people, be the thing that drives you towards others. It's the love that God's put in you. And if you're feeling that love, then you know God's with you. I'm going to stay. Start your day every day. Repent before God of your sin, your, your, your wickedness. You're, you can't earn salvation by repenting, but here's the thing. 
You want to hear from God? You want to be clear? You want to, you want to walk in the things that God's called us to? You've got to let go of the earthly things. And it's pretty natural for us to get trapped up in that stuff. Repent every day. Believe again. Stand in the truth. So important. The rest of the story, like I just said, kind of the Paul Harvey context, is that we have two sides to this. We like the idea of understanding what wisdom is, but to give up all that other stuff, to actually truly be wise, it's going to take a little bit of us in a lot of ways, isn't it? God can do that work, and he wants to. I believe that with my whole heart. Let me read um, the rest of Timothy here. This is such an important section. Paul's final words. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Damas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Hey, Paul, and even as a strong of a prophet he was, the things that he was about and the apostle he was, guess what? He had people desert him. I'm going to tell you right now, if that doesn't speak to you in your life, it needs to. Listen. When Even when you're strong and your people are going to run. That's what this says, right? This other man has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Domitia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with me, or bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychius and Ep uh, to Ephesus. When you come, be sure to bring the coat I left with Car uh, Carpus at Troas. Also bring my books, and especially my papers. Uh, we find that he's going into winter season where he's at, and if he could get that good coat back, that would mean a lot to him. How many of you guys are just blessed with so many things right now that a coat isn't the thing you'd be thinking about? But now, now I'm looking through the filter of what's really going on in Paul's life. He's in prison, and he's cold. And he's trying to remain faithful. I think it's pretty easy for me to remain faithful doing the things when I'm comfortable. But at least I think it is. Actually, I end up more distracted probably than purposeful, but that's something to think about. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. So there's wicked people, even then, doing things against God's people, making, you know, saying one thing and acting another way. Be wise, guys. Listen, who are you partnering with? What is it that God's called you to partner with? Be careful of him, for he fought against everything we said. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. So he's speaking to all his friends and everybody in this in a way. That's how he felt, right? May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. Yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, and those living in the household of uh, Onesiphorus, and Erastus stayed at Corinth, and I left at <laughs> Trophimus, sick at Miletus. He's got this little housekeeping. Do your best to get here before winter. <laughs> Eubulus sends you greetings, and so does these other people, Claudia and all the brothers and sisters, may the Lord be with you in spirit and may his grace be with you all. I just, as I was um, studying through this, this section of scripture has got so much family feel to it. I don't know if you guys know it's relationship. It's so important to understand relationship. One of the, the biggest things that I, one of the biggest issues that I keep hearing in our culture right now is in the church is, oh, we don't need to be in the church. We can do our things out here. We can do home church. And there's seasons for that, for sure, to bring people in. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people getting lost out there or not as effective or focused on their own things and saying their own <coughs> these other things. And I just see God's heart in relationship and family here for his people. And I want you guys to have that, like Paul did, with his people. Who's your people? Who's God got you in relationship with? It's deep, right? Maybe it's right here in the church. That's exciting to me. That's so exciting. It's important. But we need to come from a place of love and trust in the Lord. So I want to pray over us, and we can have a little more worship. Heavenly Father, we just ask right now that you would be glorified. Father, we ask right now that you would forgive us of our sin and unrighteousness. Father, we ask that you would be glorified in our relationships towards others. Help us to trust in you, know, knowing truthfully that the gospel, what you sent your son to do, is enough, Father. Lord, I ask right now that you would help us to be the light that Christ in us is to, 
towards others. Lord, the, the, the peace that you bring into us, Lord, let us share that with others. Let us be bold in our sharing, trusting your Holy Spirit to speak when we don't have understanding. Let the fear of not knowing what to say not stop us from putting our trust in you, believing that you can do what you say you can do. Lord, I just ask right now that our, our children, you know, the next generation, would be a priority to us. That we wouldn't be selfish in our own things, in our own distractions, and making our own life about the things that we want, Lord. But we ask that you would put into us this desire to be faithful with the blessing of our children. That, Lord, and I and I ask that not just because I'm a parent and I have that heart, but I just know what your word says about the young ones and those who are Lord, help us to not be tying millstones around our neck and because we're discouraging them and taking them out of the truth that you, you called us to. Lord, I just I ask that this time in this season that we would um, be family with you, Father, that we would trust your word. Lord, help us to really put Jesus as the head, Christ alone as the head of our families. Lord Jesus. As we ask upon your name and your authority, we pray that you would do these new works in us, that you would build us up. Lord Jesus, we need your righteousness, because in our own strength, we are fools and wicked. Lord, help us. Lord, we want to love you, we want to worship you, and we want to reflect you in everything, Father. We pray these things in your name. Jesus, amen. as we sing one more time. Holy is the Lord.
praise you this morning. We know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. God, we ask that you would produce in us patience, God. We know that patience produces character, God. I know that it's so hard for some of us to be patient and to just be still and know that you are God and you are still willing and working for your good pleasure, God. But I pray that this week we would allow your patience to have its perfect work, God, in our hearts and in our minds, in our relationships, Lord. Patience isn't weakness. And so often this world mistakes it for that, God. But we pray that you would do that work within us, God, because we struggle, we fail every day, Lord. But your patience is perfect. Be with us as we go this week, Lord. Give us opportunities to share the good news with those around us. And to be patient with one another, Lord. God, we praise you and we thank you. We give you the rest of our week. In Jesus' name, whenever you want to say, Amen. Amen. You guys have a wonderful week. Thank you.